Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar, Machine Safeguarding, Demystifying the Process, presented by EHS Today, New Equipment Digest, and Machine Design. Today's webinar is sponsored by Schmerzel. My name is Sandy Smith and I'm Editor-in-Chief of EHS Today. Before we begin, here's how you can participate in today's presentation. If you have any technical difficulties during today's session, simply hit F5 to refresh your webcast console. If you need assistance solving common issues, please click on the Help button below the slides. We welcome your questions during today's event. Just type your question into the question window on the side of your screen and then hit the Submit button. We will answer as many questions as possible during the Q&A session that will follow the main presentation, but please feel free to send your questions in at any time. Please also be aware that today's session is being recorded and will be available on the EHS Today, Machine Design, and New Equipment Digest websites within the next week. You'll be notified by email when the archive is available. And now let me introduce today's speaker. Mike DeRosier is a TUV Certified Functional Safety Engineer for Machinery. His 20 years of experience include controls engineering to design, build, and integrate full machine control systems. His safety experience led him to help corporations to develop corporate safety standards, perform machine safeguarding risk assessments, machine safety training and design, as well as implementation of safety systems for all aspects of machinery, electrical, electronic, pneumatic, hydraulic, and mechanical. Now let me turn things over to our presenter. Mike, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sandy. Appreciate it. All right. Welcome, everybody. Definitely appreciate your time today. I know uh, everybody's got busy schedules, so we're going to do our best today to try to answer some of your questions that you have on going through the machine safeguarding process and what we need to do and where to start and where to turn to to try to make the, the whole process a little simpler when it comes to machine safeguarding. And what you find is one of the biggest issues when it comes to machine guarding is where do you start. It looks like one big giant puzzle. And what we're going to try to do is break it down into five different sections for you, starting at the strategic planning, your training, your risk assessment, implementation, integration. And all five of those together fit into the slots to get your total machine safeguarding package. So when we look at this, one of the first steps that we're going to look at is the strategic planning section. The strategic planning is where you're going to develop what you're going to do, how you're going to do it, what you're going to refer to, what the process is going to be. Too many times you'll find people just trying to jump in and start guarding machines and not necessarily knowing what they're guarding, how they're guarding it, if they're using an external company, what the sections are when it comes to those particular companies. Okay. In looking at that, what we're going to break down is looking at those different plans and pushing forward in those strategic planning. And I'm sorry, bear with me here, waiting for the slide to pop up for everybody. So as you see, the first step is the strategic plan. And in developing that plan, you're going to figure out what you need to do. The last thing you want to do is have somebody come in or somebody internal just start guarding things without knowing how it needs to be done and if it's going to be done properly for you. When we look at the next steps, you'll see that we show that the training and the risk assessment kind of go hand in hand. It could be your second and or your third step, or they could be done at the same time, and that's why it may seem a little confusing at first. It really depends on what you're doing and how you're doing it from what you develop your strategic plan with. What's important with the training is getting your personnel trained on what machine guarding is and what to look for because you may be doing your own internal audits and doing the risk assessment process. 
but how do you do a good risk assessment on a machine if you haven't trained your people to be able to do that risk assessment? You may have somebody that comes in that's a, an external third-party contractor that does your risk assessment for you, but in doing that, you're still going to need that training to know how to read that risk assessment and what to do and how to implement the changes moving forward. Once you have your risk assessment and you have your training, the next thing you're going to look at is your implementation plan. Again, you don't want to jump right into it. You want to figure out what is the plan. What are you going to do to correct any of the measures that were found during the risk assessment process? Who is doing that? What are you going to do with it? What are the guarding designs that you're going to be implementing on the machine? And then the, the final step, or the fifth step, is the integration portion of it. When we look at the integration, it's when you actually develop your plan, develop your designs, and put it onto the machine itself and prove the system out to make sure you have taken care of all the different aspects related to those machines. So we're going to look at those five things individually. And we'll see this when this slide pops up. What you'll see is those five tags with the strategic plan, risk assessment training, implementation, and integration. But we're going to break those tags down into some of the different aspects to them when it comes to policy, standards, and compliance. With your risk assessment, being able to identify and quantify to be able to prioritize what you have to do on a machine. When you look at training, who needs to be trained? What are you training to? What are the actual standards that you're training to? Who's doing the implementation? What are the steps? What is the timeline? You want to develop some realistic timelines. And then the actual integration. Where is the design being done? The fabrication. Who's installing and validating those, those particular areas? So the first section we're going to look at is the strategic plan. This is where your starting point is. We all have aspirations of putting the best safety out on the machines, and just turning it over and saying make the machine safe is not good to do. As I mentioned earlier, you're not going to always get what you needed to get on the machine. So when we look at the strategic plan, we're going to consider policy, standards, compliance, regulations, which... This can be a you know, several-hour topic in itself, so I'm going to give you some starting points on what to look at. First, you have to look at what your internal company policies are. Do you have existing safety standards? Do they need to be up to date? Are you using consensus standards? At a minimum, you're always going to be looking at government regulations, such as in the United States, as OSHA, up in Canada, you have the Ministry of Labor. In the U.S., some states have state-run OSHA programs, and you have to follow the state-run, such as you know, Cal OSHA, California OSHA. If you're going into Europe, there are certain European guidelines and standards that you need to follow. So it's understanding in your specific region what those standards are. So if we take the United States, as an example, you have OSHA as the governing body. They have their 29 CFR 1910 in regards to dot .212 for general machine guarding requirements. That is the general standard that OSHA government officials go by when it relates to machine safeguarding standards. But on top of that, OSHA does encourage people to follow voluntary industry consensus standards, such as ANSI or NFPA, which gives you a lot more details on going through designs of machine safeguarding. Here within this little subsection of your strategic plan, when you deal with policies and standards and procedures, one of the big questions that comes up is, 
well, which ones do I need to follow for my machine? Standards are broken into different types. You have type A, type B, and type C standards. Type C standards are specific to machines, such as the robotic standards. If you're dealing with robots or robot cells, there is a specific ANSI RIA standard for dealing with robot to robot cells. That's 15.06. Uh, last update was just a couple years ago for Dash 2012. With B standards, they're more specific to a group. It's not specific to a machine, but it's specific to a group, and a lot of people use B standards because they're going to apply to different types of machines. Where A standards requires all machines with an encompassing broad stroke that they're just giving you general principles. They're not going into a lot of details, but general principles such as risk assessment. ISO 12100 is a type A standard. They're going over general principles for machine guarding and risk analysis and what you do for all machines. It's not specific to a group or specific to a machine. At this point, I know I haven't clarified much in the way of standards, so I'm going to go into it just a little bit further for you. When you look in OSHA standards and you look at what their general requirements are for machine guarding, that is the regulatory body that you have to comply to those standards. And it basically says you need to keep people safe from serious harm on a machine. Very general, but it opens up the question was, how do I do that? When you look at institutions such as ANSI, and I list some examples there, B11.19 would be classified as a type B standard. It's not specific to a broad stroke of machines. It's specific to machine tools, but it's general principles for all machine tools. B65.1 is the printing press standard. That's a type C standard where it's specific to printing presses. So if you're dealing with the printing press type of machine, you have a specific standard to go by. ANSI will have several different standards in the, the B standards to go off of when it comes to machine guarding and how you safely integrate guarding solutions onto those machines as well as functions on those machines. ISO is very all-encompassing because it's international. That's what ISO stands for, International Standards Organization. A lot of organizations such as ANSI and EN for the European norm have either adopted ISO standards or they have taken pieces of ISO standards to make part of their own. I'll jump back to the B65 standard as an example. B65, if you read the latest version of that, they reference a lot of ISO 13849 and what performance levels a safety function on a printing press is required to have. They may say this specific function on the printing press has to meet a performance level D, which relates into more statistical data about that function when you get to probability of dangerous failure per hour or mean time to dangerous failure on a type of hardware device and rating. That is all pulled from ISO 13849. There are several ISO standards that are good resources as a general basis for companies to be able to adopt, like 13849 or ISO 12100, which I mentioned earlier was the risk analysis and general machine guarding standard. There's other ones related to that, 13850 for emergency stop devices, um, 13855 for minimum safe distance when using present sensing devices, 13857 for gaps in guards, how far away does the guard have to be based off of the gap or you're reaching over or under from your upper or lower limbs. There are specific good ISO standards to have a company standardized on to use as a good rule of thumb for proper safety practices implemented. NFPA is a U.S. organization. We deal with NFPA 70, as you see listed there. That's our national electric code. What are the electric codes followed for conduit and wire sizes and wireways and ampacities? 
but more of a subsection is NFPA 79, which pulls a lot from NFPA 70, but deals more with industrial controls of machines. What are the color code requirements for push buttons? Their position on a panel. What is the wiring color code required inside the panel? So there's a lot of specific standards in the design of the control panels and how to safely design those, which is covered in NFPA 79. 70E, which is arc flash. And then another international, the IEC, such as 62061, you may have heard dealing with sill levels. So one of your very first starting points is your strategic plan where you're going to go through and try to evaluate what company policies, your internal company policies are going to be. You need to establish what are you going to try to meet, what standards are you going to use to meet those. You have your government regulations for your local municipalities, whether it's in the U.S., Europe, Canada. You need to follow government regulations, number one. You have to look at voluntary industry consensus standards because they are going to backfill whatever is missing from the government standards. And then any other policies or standards or procedures that the company itself has come up with and has learned through the years. Remember, your policies are a living document. As technology changes, increases, new innovations, new ways of guarding to make it more acceptable on machines to make it easier to work with. You want to keep modifying and reviewing your company's standards to incorporate any newer standards or updates. You don't want to just be a one and done, write it, and finish off. So the next thing we're going to look at is looking at some of the questions. You have to look at these questions in your strategic plan to figure out what are your steps. What risk assessment methodology will be used? When we talk about risk assessment, and we'll talk a little bit about that, you need to understand what's being used, whether you're doing it internally for yourself or you're having an external third party come in, understand what their process is, and where they're coming up with their quantification so you have a better understanding of what the true hazards are and what they're rated at. Why is that important? You need to know what is important to you as a company, what do you have to safeguard, and what is an acceptable or tolerable level of risk because it poses such a low risk factor. You don't need to put a guarding measure on that because it's a low severity, low frequency, low occurrence type of scenario. Timelines. One of the biggest things that we often see is everybody wants to have things done right away. And that's great in the perfect world where you can stop the world from spinning. But reality is you can have 100 machines on your floor there is no way you're going to take care of 100 machines within a week or even within a month. You need to have some realistic timelines to know what is your implementation process. You know that there's going to be capital investment in taking care of an entire facility, as an example, on implementing new guarding or proper guarding on a machine and tying it into the controls effectively. So you need to develop some realistic timelines on when you need to get those tasks performed, and your risk assessment will help you with that because it's going to help you prioritize. Knowing that you can't take care of everything right away, what are some of the highest risk factors that you have on a machine or a group of machines that you may say, this type of machine we need to take care of within the next three months and get this resolved. This is our highest factor of risk in our plant that we have the highest likelihood of somebody actually getting severely hurt. We need to take care of these right away. And as you go down the list, you can extend out that timeline to get some realistic expectations on what needs to be done. Documentation. There's nothing more important than having all the proper documentation in place, meaning your risk assessment documents. What did you come up with? What did you do to fix it? 
what is the resolution, and maintaining that document. What are all the manufacturer's data sheets and installation instructions for all the safety components or hardware that's used in the guarding of that machine? Have the electrical and pneumatic schematics been updated to reflect any of the changes that were made on the machine? You need to make sure you maintain accurate documentation. Who's doing the process? Is it everything being done internal? Do you need external resources for this? This is all part of that strategic plan. Who's taking care of it? What do you need to do? What other resources do you need? You know that there's going to be some downtime. Do you have to build up production from that machine, or is there another machine that can pick up that production while you're making the modifications and changes? What's the plan moving forward, meaning once you do your risk assessment, what are your steps? Who are you going to use? What are you going to do? What's your timeline? How are you going to accomplish these tasks? How are you going to get it from A to Z and make it complete and don't stop somewhere in the middle? What specific standards are you going to be using to the different machines? And your machine safeguarding team. It's not going to be one person. You may have a project manager that's overseeing this, but who's going to be that team? Who's going to look at different aspects of the machine when performing the risk analysis? Having a team of three or five people and evaluating what needs to be done so you can come to a common consensus as a company of what is best for the, the company when it comes to machine safeguarding. When we look at risk assessment, we're looking at identifying the hazards. We're quantifying it, meaning we're putting a number to it to give it some sort of level so you are able to prioritize. So when you identify, you're going to look at recognized hazards. ISO 12100 is a great resource for laying out all the different hazard types that can be found on the machines. When you look at this, you're going to look at what are the limits of the machines. Do you have use limits? Do you have operator limits? What are the hazard types? You can have mechanical, electrical, ergonomic, a combination of hazards, thermal, noise, vibration. What are the different hazards that can be on a machine, and does that machine have them? You're going to look at reasonable and foreseeable misuse, meaning looking at how a machine is being run. Is it feasible to expect somebody to do something to machine that they're not supposed to. If that's foreseeable, you need to accommodate for that to make sure that whatever they need to do, they have to do with the safeguards in place to maintain a certain safety level. Recognize personnel access areas, meaning where does an operator or maintenance have to access that machine? Where do they have to work? What are the tests that need to be performed? There are different risk assessment methodologies. Not one methodology is the go-to methodology. There are several of them out there. ANSI TR3, for example, gives you a methodology. ISO 12100 gives you a methodology. Um, it's, there's several different methodologies. The PMMI may give you a methodology. Whatever methodology you choose, you can create your own. You just want it to be consistent throughout your facility that you're always using the same methodology so your quantification process always comes out to be the same. What are the documentation? What is your current guarding versus what you need to have done? So when we look at quantification, some of the two most common methods that we've seen out there is the multiplication method and the addition method. You see the multiplication on the bottom of the screen there where the addition is showing the blocks stacked up. Basically, you look at, I want to say most commonly, the four factors, the severity of harm, your frequency of exposure, your possibility of avoiding the hazard if something were to move, and how many people are exposed at a given time frame on the machine when they're performing that function. Based off of that, you will apply a number. 
whether it's one block, two blocks, three blocks, ten blocks, whatever that numbering sequence that you come up with or you pull from a standard, the multiplication method will multiply those numbers out to give you an overall hazard rating. The addition method does the same thing. The more severe, the more frequent, the more uh, possibility of avoidance that is not there, the larger number of people, it's just going to get more blocks stacked up to give you a higher priority. Either methodology is going to give you a number, and you follow that methodology throughout your facility so you can determine what are your highest hazards in your facility on your specific machines that you really need to take care of right away and develop those priorities. So when you go to prioritize, what you're going to come up with is a list. Using that example, if you have 100 machines out on the floor, and if you come up with 20 to 30 lines or hazards per machine, you end up with two to 3,000 individual line items. And two to 3,000 line items, you can see this huge list, and it can be very overwhelming and you start seeing the wheels start turning, and it's like, wow, what do we do? We have all these items we have to take care of. Well, you quantified it, so now you can prioritize. You're coming back to your plan. What are the priorities? What do you need to do? Where are the highest hazards? What do you have to work on first to get the, because of the greatest exposure that you have on the machine? You can now prioritize where your hazards are, and do what you need to do and start developing your plan. Now, in doing that, I'm going to come back and say what I said earlier. You don't just go forward and just start guarding things based off of that. Do you really know what kind of guarding is on or needs to be on the machine? What are effective solutions? Are you considering the operators and the design? To turn that piece of paper over to a third party to say, here are hazards, go fix it, let me know when it's done, it's not going to be a good solution because you don't know if it was properly implemented. So the second and third thing that we were talking about is risk assessment goes along with training. So you have your risk assessment, but in conjunction, whether it comes after the risk assessment or before or with the risk assessment, you need to get some training for your personnel. You need to determine who are you training. Is it the environmental health and safety people? Do you train operators? Absolutely. You're not going to have the same type of training with operators that you do with maintenance or engineering staff because they need to get more in-depth on the logic, the circuits, the guarding, the principles. Operators don't need to know that, but they need to understand how safeguarding works, how do safety switches work in order to be effective solutions to keep them safe. How do you properly operate this machine with proper SOPs? If you're doing internal risk assessment, get in that training on risk assessment. Train your people that are going to be the team that's going to be doing your risk analysis. Train them so everybody's working off of a consistent format. Get machine guarding training. Understand the types of guards, the types of devices that are in there. In conjunction with that type of training, you have to look at your safe work processes and procedures and the products that you use. You can put the best guard on a machine, but that guard can become ineffective if you don't develop your documentation in your SOPs to make sure people are using and following that properly and they have been trained on properly following safe work procedures. What tasks are needed to be done on a machine? Are there 10 different tasks or are there 50 different tasks? What is the safe way of performing those tasks on the machine? Is it shutting the machine down? Can you rely on the safeguarding? Does it fall under a lockout, tagout condition? You need to lay out all the tasks that are performed on the machine to determine what is the proper safeguarding measure that needs to be implemented. So when we look at training a little bit further, and you look at some of the types of training, first off is the guarding, your machine guarding. If you're going to be implementing guarding, 
Are you using hard guards, fences, gates, movable devices, lift off? What type of guarding? What is proper guarding on the machine? Make sure your people understand that the ones that are going to be either building, designing, or just auditing, making sure the proper guards have been put in place, which comes back to the importance of documentation. What guards were put on there? What needs to be on there? Are the guards still in place? What types of guards? When you use hard guarding versus present sensing devices, such as a light curtain or a safety mat or a laser scanner, when you use those type of devices, do you need to use a hard guard? Can they be used in exchange with one another? There are certain design considerations around that. But when you look at guarding solutions, when you look at a hard guard, whether it's fixed or uh, gated type of guards, what types of safety devices need to be on those guards to determine that the machine is in a safe condition to be able to run? The fencing has been closed. The gate has been closed. Do you use safety rated limit switches or key interlock switches or safety rated hinge switches? The key behind all these devices is that they're safety rated devices that are on that guard. You cannot use standard limit switches or standard proximity switches to be used as a safety devices. They can be easily defeated. They have the potential of failing to an unsafe condition where safety devices are rated to fail to a safe condition. Other devices that could go on guards could be locking type of switches or non-contact, whether it be coded magnetic or electronic type of devices that give you more gap tolerance and diagnostic information to give back to your controller to give you status of what the safety system is doing, where are the faults, what type of faults do you have. The last type that can go on a guarding is a key exchange type of system where you Minimize the amount of wiring on a fence. You see a lot on like robot cells where you have a key exchange system to make sure that a robot cannot run until the keys are put back into place. What other devices can or need to go on a machine? Emergency stop devices. It's not just a red mushroom push button. There are certain design criteria around an emergency stop. ISO 13850 I mentioned earlier is the design criteria for an emergency stop device. It needs to be constructed a specific way. <coughs> Excuse me, having a red with a yellow background, how does a rope pull used for safety devices supposed to work? Being that positive self-latching. Are you using mats or edges and bumpers where it will trigger a machine to enter that safe condition in a safe stop type of scenario? You can see some of the standards like ISO 13856 for mats and bumpers. When you go to present sensing devices, you also have optical devices such as single beam or light curtains or laser scanners. When you look at those devices, you need to look at minimum safe distance formulas. There's a formula based off of stop time and approach speed. What do you need to apply and what formulas do you use? ISO 13855 is a great standard for that. It covers the different types of present sensing devices and how they're being used, horizontal, vertical, safety mats, reach over, reach through. <clears throat> what do you need to do and how far do they need to be mounted from a machine to be effective safety devices? One of the common mistakes that you would see is a light curtain, as an example, replacing a fixed guard or a fixed gate or door on a machine because they have the frame there. It's convenient. They can mount the light curtains right there, but not knowing the stop time of the machine, you find too many times that the light curtains are actually mounted too close to the machine, and somebody can still potentially get hurt if they reach through that light curtain when they're expecting that light curtain to shut down at the exact time that they trigger that machine so they do not get hurt. Other devices you consider are the two-hand control if you're using a two-hand anti-tie-down type of station. What are the design standards that are revolved around that? Or enabling devices, an example, to do setup or triggering functions. 
this is all external, but you got to think about the things that the operators don't see, such as the safety monitoring relays and controllers, the logic, the brains behind the safety devices to make sure that they are functioning properly, the safety valves, using a redundant safety valve to make sure your air is dumped or hydraulic pressure is dumped off of the machine or blocked to make sure that that machine goes into a safe condition to prevent somebody from getting hurt. You see here an example of a schematic of a safety device hooked up to a relay to redundant mechanically linked contactors. Why is that important? It's because this is invisible to the operator. An operator doesn't see how these things are wired up. They only see that they open up a door, the machine shuts down, they close the door, they hit reset, the machine can start running again. Having the proper safety devices behind the scenes is a key in training people what are those safety devices, what are the different ways a safety circuit can be wired. In ISO 13849, you got control categories, control categories B, 1, 2, 3, 4, in order to achieve that ultimate performance level. Well, what does that mean? How do you know you're getting exactly what you need? You need to provide that training to the people that will be able to review it for you. Now that we covered those steps, the next step is the implementation plan. When we look at the implementation, you have to look at what those next steps are. What's your timeline? We mentioned you got to have a realistic timeline. You'll know by your risk analysis what you have to do. Now you can establish a very good, effective timeline. What is the cost going to be? What do we need? What are the expectations? Do we have to take a machine down? How long does that machine need to be down? What is the scope of supply? You want to make sure you get the details of what needs to be done if you're using an external contractor to make changes for you, what needs to be done to make this machine safe for your personnel for running that machine. Develop that implementation plan and look at those timelines and put those into place. You don't want to just develop the documentation and then have it sit in a corner and never do anything with the machine. The whole concept is put a proper machine guarding policy and program in place from start to finish. So your strategic plan, your risk assessment and training, now your implementation plan. Once you have your implementation plan, you're now left with integration. You have your plan. What do you do? What are the steps to finish this off and implement to a machine? You need to come up with designs. It's not just a mechanical design. Is there electronic, pneumatic, hydraulic consideration? Is there fluid you need to deal with? Is there ergonomic consideration? What are the design aspects of the guard before you do anything to that machine? What are you going to do? How are you going to do it? How is it going to be designed? Your fabrication. What type of guarding are you going to use? Are you using separating, non-separating, meaning fixed guards, barrier guards? Are you using something like a light curtain? What type of devices? How is it being implemented? How is it going to get approved? So if we look at the design phase, with the design phase, you're going to look at the drawings of the machine. What are the expectations of that particular machine? What are the hard guard designs? What are the parameters? What are the schematics? How are you going to tie that in? Who's going to build this for you? Is it internal or is it external? Who's going to review any changes to that? Once you do all that, then you can go to your fabrication. When you go to your fabrication, What's going to be built? How's it going to be built? How's it actually going to get to the machine? What type of hardware are you going to use? You want to review this process all along the way to make sure you get exactly what you need. Looking at the actual designs is going to be uh, critical for you. 
what components are going to be used? Is it going to be sturdy enough? Meaning, what type of materials are you going to need on that type of machine? When we look at the integration, now that you have the design, it's been fabricated, now you have your schedule and your plan to take that machine out of service to put the changes into place. During that design and fabrication, considering who's using the machine, the operators, the maintenance, the engineering, what are they doing on that machine in order to give you exactly what you need with minimizing any impact on production, okay? How long is it going to take? Do you need two days of downtime, five days of downtime? What are the resources that are going to be required? If you have external contractors, does your contractors need to have training and approved by your internal departments or EHS to make sure that they can work safely on site for you? You think that you're done, but we do have one final step, and that's validation. Validation to a lot of people means a lot of different things. But in simplifying this, what we're looking at when it comes to validation is did you get exactly what you expected, what you needed? Did all the hazards get taken care of? Did the guarding create any new hazards on the machine? What else needs to be done, if anything? Go through that process again and identify it. Did the system get tied in schematically the way it needed to be? Your safety circuitry, you've designed a high-level safety circuit for control category 3 or control category 4, for example. Did you put the faults in there to make sure the safety circuit reacted the way it was supposed to? Did the machine still stop and was prevented from restarting because of that fall. Do you actually put that in there and test it out? Redo the assessment, document what you did, what the guarding solution has been put into place. That way, when you go to reassess your machine a year, two years, three years from now, you can go through and make sure you get all your guarding is still in place and nothing has changed on that machine to introduce any new hazards. So at this point, I know we went through a whole lot in a very short amount of time, and I apologize if I flew too far or too fast into some of those things, but our goal today was to try to give you that overview of where to start and what to do and where to go to in order to have an effective machine safeguarding program put into place within your company. So at this time, Sandy, let's uh, open up the questions. That sounds great, Mike. Um, we've already received quite a few questions, so we will jump right in in a second. Uh, while Mike is answering your questions, please take a moment to answer the feedback form that appears on your screen. If you don't see the form, please click the red survey button at the bottom of your screen. And now to our first question, where in OSHA directive is risk assessment required? In a specific OSHA directive, I haven't found anything in a specific active directive. I have found it in a proposed directive on doing risk assessment. And when you look at other industry standards, such as voluntary consensus standards, meaning I had mentioned earlier that OSHA encourages people to follow industry consensus standards, they're going to be more up to date than they owe, than OSHA is, but they're not going to override any existing OSHA standard. They are complementing OSHA standards. And a lot of the industry standards, and one specific I'll pull out is the uh, PMMI standard. The PMMI standard calls out the need for a risk assessment. ISO 12100 calls out the need for a risk assessment. ISO 13849 calls out the need for a risk assessment. And if you think about it, the risk assessment, when we started talking about strategic plan and going into the risk assessment, how do you know what needs to be done on a machine if you don't do your risk assessment? If you don't know what the hazards are, if you don't know what the quantification or the priorities, or even if something needs to be done without doing a proper risk assessment. Now, in saying that, it doesn't mean that you have to have 
some third-party certified body to come in to do risk assessment. This can be done on your own. You develop a team internally, train them on what needs to be done on a risk assessment, and do it internally. It's an internal thing that you can go through and develop and identify the hazards on the machine so you know what the next steps are going to be. Okay. Is there any list of ISO standards that you can review for applicability? Say it one more time for me, Sandy. Is there any list of ISO standards that you can review for applicability? There, when you go to different component manufacturers, uh, either websites or documentation or catalogs, will review a lot of different ISO standards. I haven't found one place that said if you have this type of machine, these are the standards that apply. Um, if somebody knows something, please let me know. But I haven't found any site that said this is where you go for this particular machine. Um, sometimes it's really more learning as you go. You figure out the machine and apply the appropriate ISO standard or ANSI standard related around that machine. In, in absence of not knowing of a specific type C, because you may not find a specific type C standard for that specific machine, you'd always refer back to the general standards that I mentioned throughout the a webinar with the ISO 12100, ISO 13849, ISO 13850, 851, 854, 856, 855, 857. There's some of the core standards, core type A or type B standards that you can refer to for uh, machine safeguarding. Okay. For new machines, wouldn't the manufacturer build in the machine guarding into the machine they build and sell? Wouldn't they be liable for injury should an injury occur? It's a, that's a very open-ended question, and I think the short answer to that is it depends on the lawyers. And in saying that, an equipment manufacturer will always assume some sort of liability because they built the machine and in a court of law, you know, again, I'm going to mention specifically the U.S., if they are found negligent of not providing a safe machine, it's going to be very hard to defend yourself on saying, well, there was no specific standard that said I need to guard it this way. If they can very easily prove of standards that are out there or they knew of better principles and practices, then it will be easy to put liability back on an OEM in a court of law. But it, it really depends on the lawyers, the juries that you have, the, the system, and going through that process. As far as government regulations are concerned, OSHA regulates the end user, meaning the owner of the equipment. Whoever owns that equipment, if OSHA were to walk into your facility and they find that machine unsafe, they are not issuing citation to the OEM that built the machine. They're issuing the citation to the facility that's using the machine. They're the ones that own it. They're the ones that put their operators or contractors to work on that machine. And if that machine is deemed unsafe by OSHA, they're the ones that are going to get the citations, not the OEM. Would you expect or want OEMs to be building safe machines? Absolutely. But just like a lot of people that may be on the webinar today, safety is not always a clear-cut process, which is why we have this particular webinar on trying to take those steps out of the place. Just like an end user, an OEM may not have the training and their engineers to know what the machine safety requirements are either. Just because they're an OEM and they don't know it doesn't make them a bad OEM. They may make a great machine. They may need the education just like the end user does. Some of them may already have that education, and they're building that right from the get-go. When it comes down to it, it's a joint effort between the end user and the OEM working together to establish the proper safety on the machine that the end user is going to have. They may see things differently than what the end user has. The end user may have higher requirements than what the OEM may have on the machine to determine that, the end user says this machine needs to be safer than what you're making it, where the OEM says 
we believe we have put the proper safety in place. So the more you can clarify up front before you actually place a purchase order to know what you're getting and what the expectations are, but never assume that you're going to have full safeties on a machine because you may not. You want to make sure you clarify and communicate between the end user and the OEM of what safety is getting put on because sometimes an OEM will learn from their customers. Hey, if this customer wants it, my five other big customers are going to want this too. I learned something new. I'm going to make this standard and implement it on the process. They've learned and they made a safer machine for their customers. Okay. Do you provide a basic template to use in the machine guarding process? I'm not sure if I'm understanding that question right. So if I say this differently than what it's understood, just please uh, rephrase the question of whoever answered that. So do we provide a basic template? There's not one basic template aside from what we went over today. ISO 12100 will help you lay out some of the machine guarding needs, um, but going through the process of what we just laid out on those five key factors, there's no formal template that we have that we just have posted on our website, do this, this, and this, this. It's going to vary on the type of equipment you have. It's going to vary depending on the type of training that you need. So your starting point when we mention the strategic plan, why we call it a strategic plan? Because every facility is going to be different. So doing one canned process would work maybe for one company but not work for five others or may work for three but not the other two. You really got to develop that process to say, okay, this is the type of equipment we have. This is our process. This is what we're going to go through. This is our plan. Okay. ISO 13849 was a voluntary standard. How, when do I need to follow it? How do I know when to apply any other voluntary standards? I mentioned earlier OSHA recognizes and encourages people to follow. They're not going to say we mandate you to follow industry standards because in order for them to mandate, it has to go through an act of Congress and make it into law. We know that it's a very timely process, and by the time it gets implemented, that standard's already been updated and changes. Most of the time, standards will get updated every three to five years. You'll see changes because the technology changes. Things change quickly. Things are learned, newer technologies that accommodate certain safety aspects on machines. Things are going to change and develop and um, be implemented. So even though they're considered voluntary standards, it really comes down to, one, doing the right thing by using voluntary standards because they're going to help you in your machine safeguarding needs. And something like that was specifically mentioned in the question, ISO 13849, a lot of the standards in ANSI or ISO are all referring back to something like ISO 13849. They have it in their reference. They have it in subsections where they pull specific performance levels out or what to do or how to do it. So, yes, there's no legal requirement by government to say, you know, by OSHA to say you have to use voluntary consensus standards. However, knowing of voluntary consensus standards and you choose not to and somebody gets hurt because you didn't choose to use the voluntary consensus standard because you try to make the claim, well, OSHA doesn't require me to, that's not going to hold up in a court of law because it still comes down to the general duty clause. You need to protect your people from serious harm on a machine. And if a voluntary consensus standard is going to help you do that to protect your people from serious harm, you would use the voluntary consensus standard. That's the U.S., Something like ISO 13849 is a requirement in the European Union for any country that is part of the CE or the EU um, community. CE requires machines to be compliant with ISO 13849. So over in Europe, that is not a voluntary standard. It's a requirement for the CE process. In the U.S., it's voluntary because it has not been adopted by OSHA, for example. 
I hope that answers that question. I know a lot of these questions tend to get in a little gray area, and it gets left up to interpretation on who you talk to, what inspector, what lawyer. Okay. Uh, what's the best way to explain to a corporate-level director the need for risk assessments in a facility if there's no OSHA directive that requires it? Well, it depends on the type of corporate person. A lot of times they look at dollars and cents, and depending on your company, some higher-up corporate people understand the value of safety. They, they have a goal of safety being one of the top priorities in the company and not letting any of their employees get hurt. Unfortunately, there are other companies that, that isn't a higher priority. It's looked at as a cost factor because it's hard to develop an ROI, which is a return on investment. It's easy to do when you buy a new machine that produces 100 widgets a minute, you can calculate a return on investment. But spending X number of dollars to upgrade an existing machine to make it safe doesn't necessarily improve productivity on that machine, so getting a return on investment is difficult to calculate. But there are things on OSHA's website. There's a, a software package that OSHA has that's web-based now called OSHA Pays. You can use that as a tool for somebody that looks at the dollars and cents to say, hey, if we get this type of injury, it's going to cost us this amount of money in direct and indirect costs to just recover from that injury with insurance costs, locks, lost work days, machine changes. So you can either be proactive as a company to truly want to protect your people, or you're going to be reactive. Hopefully you never get to that point, but sometimes things aren't done until somebody gets seriously hurt or killed on a machine, and all of a sudden you become reactive to it. You don't want to get into that position to say, you know what, if we just did this three months ago, this never would have happened. You never want to be in that situation. Obviously, I don't think anybody on this line wants to see that happen. But we know it's hard to convince the, the powers that be that uh, make all the decisions to say, yes, we are doing this, no, we're not doing this, but to help them understand that there are cost factors if somebody does get hurt. It's obviously not a guarantee accidents do happen, but how do you minimize those accidents? And going through that process with them to say, hey, we need to identify where we are, what we need to do, just because we don't have any historical data. Or some companies may have historical data to say, you know what, last year we had two amputations. If we would have did this, we could have prevented those amputations. Uh, in a scenario where we've never had an injury in this facility or on this machine, it doesn't mean you'll never get an injury. If the machine is not properly safeguarded, it, it could be a time bomb. It could be something that's waiting to happen. You want to prevent that from even getting to it. It's almost like uh, if you think about buying an insurance policy. You know, what good is insurance policy if you never use it? You know, you may never get into an accident in your car, but you have to have insurance on it. Why? In case you do. Well, putting the safeguarding is trying to help ensure or try to prevent somebody from getting hurt. And hey, cost factors are one thing, but obviously in my mind, the number one thing is I don't want to see anybody get hurt. They shouldn't go through a life-changing event, losing a finger or a hand, or family losing a mother or a father because of something wasn't guarded properly on a machine. That shouldn't be the expectation to go work on a machine. And if you can't look in the mirror and say, hey, would I work on that machine? Maybe you would because we tend to take higher risk within ourselves. But would I let somebody I care about, would I let my wife or my husband or my son or daughter, would I feel comfortable letting them go work on that machine. And if your answer is no, you know there's an issue with guarding there. If you feel that it's an unsafe machine that you wouldn't trust somebody that you care about on there, why would you let anybody else work on that in an unsafe condition? And in saying that, depending on what level of management you're talking about, there have been cases where people were told to go work on a machine by their supervisor knowing that it was unsafe and got hurt. 
supervisors I have heard can be criminally liable and go to jail for making somebody work on an unsafe machine when it was brought to their attention. If that happens, you know, you never want to see that happen. You, you hear the stories. You don't want to be a statistic. Well, and on that note, uh, we're going to conclude today's presentation. I want to remind everyone that this will be available, archived on um, EHS Today, New Equipment Digest, and Machine Design um, in, within the next week, and you will receive an email letting you know when it's available on the archive. And on behalf of EHS Today, New Equipment Digest, and Machine Design, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. And thank you to Schmerzel for sponsoring this event and for Mike, to Mike for the great presentation. And everyone have a productive and safe remainder of the day. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you, everybody, for your time.